morning. I hope y'all are doing well on this beautiful Sunday morning. As uh, we get started this morning, I want you to remember uh, Brother Donald McIntyre is in the hospital. Keep him in your prayers. Of course, we had a large list in uh, the, the prayer group this morning in the, the pastor's office. And on the back of your bulletins, there's a large list of names on there, of different ones. Miss Hazel is back home. Miss Hazel uh, is back home. She had made a, she had fallen uh, just the other day and went to be with her daughter for just a little while, but she's back home now. Keep her in your prayers also. You're going to notice on there also about the, the shoe boxes. I want y'all to be praying about this, uh, whether you can donate to it or donate to the cost of shipping it. What's that, Hannah? It's like $9 a box to ship it. Uh, maybe you want to donate to be able to pay the cost. Last year we sent out how much? 127? 100 and some boxes, like 120 some boxes. And what this does is it goes to spread out there to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? So keep that in your prayers also. And I'm going to ask you to do something for me today. Because they have started me on a new blood pressure pill. Now, most of y'all don't know, you might know who I am or who I'm not. I have reactions to these blood pressure pills. I just started the other day, and I want to tell you, I'm having a reaction. <laughs> so please pray for me today, because it's driving me crazy up here as I'm trying to concentrate and see this. Um, remember the revival coming up, so it's going to be Bible prophecy, September the 15th through the 18th. Uh, please keep that in your prayers. Uh, we're going to have... The flight crew will be coming Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And, of course, ours, where's Dave at? Dave ain't here today. I need Dave. What's the name of that crew? He always talks about, what, what's he call that? The, uh, the Broken Five or something like that. <laughs> he calls the group. Well, we're going to have our, our uh, praise team going to be leading us on that Sunday morning and that Sunday night. So be praying about that. Get a chance. Uh, we're going to be giving you some flyers pretty soon where you can hand out flyers to uh, invite people. Uh, to hear the gospel message, and you're going to hear the truth. You're going you're gonna to like it. You don't want to miss it. Bible prophecy. You're going to want to hear this message, so keep that in your prayers. Anything else? Yeah, my mom and dad's coming home uh, tomorrow, so keep them in your prayers also, and us on that too. Anything else? All right, let's worship, Brother Raymond. Yes. Come here, hold me up. Uh, <laughs> so me and Brother Raymond went down to Wade Rock the other day. And uh, some of y'all haven't been to Wade Rock. It, do y'all know what Wade Rock is, any of y'all? So this church has been baptizing at Wade Rock for 128 years. And then, of course, they developed to um, have their baptism pools like back here. So we're going to have a creek baptism. And um, Brother Jack... It's going to be one I'm baptizing. Maybe, maybe you've never been baptized. Or maybe you have it in the wrong location. You can't be baptized before you're saved. I want you to remember this. You can't be baptized before you're saved. Now, the baptism ain't going to save you. But it's your testimony. But if you'd like to be baptized in a creek down there, we're going to be having that creek down there. It's going to be beautiful. You're going to enjoy it. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll do it. Sign up back there. Brother Raymond uh, is going to be clearing it out. And we're going to have it where it's going to be deep enough. I don't care how big you are. We're going to have it deep enough. I can put any one of y'all in there and get you under the water. It's going to be all right. So, <laughs> did I forget anything? It's going to be nice. All right. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're going to see. <laughs> one of the songs is going to be Gather at the River, right? Yeah. All right. This is the first Sunday in a month. So we're going to uh, recognize birthdays before we get started, okay? If you got a birthday in August, won't you stand up? We're going to sing happy birthday to you. I got one. <laughs> Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Stand now. Let's sing at Calvary. <laughs> and 
standing for our opening prayer. Brother Ellis, would you lead us as we pray? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, Lord, that we could come out to your house, Lord, this morning. God, we thank you for that grace, Lord. God, we thank you for the mercy that you show on us each and every day. Father, I pray, Lord, as we gather here today, Lord, we won't just come because it's a Sunday, Lord, and it's a time set aside for this church, Lord, but we would come, Lord, wanting to hear from you, Lord. God, that we would want to hear that word, Lord, that just pierces our heart, Lord, our soul and our mind, Lord. Lord, that we may use that for correction and direction in our life, Lord, that you may just speak in a mighty way today, Lord. I ask you to be with Brother Blaine, Lord, this morning. Yes, God. I ask you to be with him, Lord, with his health, Lord. I ask you to pray, Lord, that you would just fill him with your spirit this morning, Lord. Mentally, physically, and spiritually touch him this morning, Lord, as he presents the gospel, Lord of your saving grace this morning. Father, we just ask you to continue to be with the song service in every way, Lord. God, we just want to pray for those that's less fortunate than we are this morning that's not able to be here, Lord, for whatever reason it may be. We ask you to lift them up and encourage them this morning. Father, we ask you for the brokenhearted this morning, Lord, for those that have lost loved ones, Lord, all across this land. Lord, as we turn on the TV and look at the news, Lord, we realize, Lord, that tragedy and evil is everywhere, Lord. God, and we just pray, Lord, that that you would just shine your light on a lost and dying world, Lord, because it doesn't change who you are and who's in control this morning. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us an opportunity this morning, each and every one, Lord, to call upon your name, Lord, to repent of our sins, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, Lord, and, God, that we might have eternal life. Go with us and lead and guide and direct us, Lord. Forgive us where we failed you. For Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, our next song is How Firm a Foundation, number 
number 379, brethren, we have met to worship. That's what we're here for this morning, is worship our Lord and Savior. This will be our offertory hymn, so let's stand together again as we sing. First, second, and last verse. thank you for allowing us to come back to your house this morning, Lord, to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have given us throughout this past week, for keeping us safe from harm and danger. Lord, I pray that you would be with us in this service this morning as we worship you, that you would, we can feel your presence here with us, Lord, that you would bless us in a way that we we leave here this morning that we know that we can say that it's been great to be in the house of God. Pray for Brother Blaine this morning, Lord, that he's not feeling good this morning, Lord, that you would touch his body. Just help him, Lord, that he would be able to bring your word to us this morning. Pray for this time of our service that you would bless the gift and the giver, Lord. Forgive us where we've failed you. For these things I ask in your name. Amen. <coughs>
That's going to be a great day, isn't it? Until the day God calls me home. Amen. I, I heard a quartet last night down in Woodville, Mississippi. I tell you what, it was the best singing I've heard in a long time. The Legacy Five. Great, great service. Miss Ruth is going to bring our special music for us this morning. We're going to do one. I did this at the nursing home Thursday with my brother and the two guys that play with him. And I think I did pretty good with those guitars, but I think Sharon can beat them. <laughs> so we're going to try it on the piano. Life's Railway to Heaven. <clears throat> Life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer that's brave. We must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave. Watch the curves, the furrows eternal, never falter, never fail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eyes upon the rail. Oh, blessed Savior, Thou will guide us till we meet. That blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in that praise forevermore. You will roll up graves of trial, you will cross a bridge of strife. See that Christ is your conductor. All this lightning train of life, always mindful of instruction. Do your duty, never fail. Keep your hands upon the throttle and your eyes upon the rail. Blessed Savior, Thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in Thy praise forevermore. You will often find instruction. Look for storms of wind and rain. On a field, a curve, or trestle. Put your trust alone in Him. Never fall to never fail. Just keep your eyes upon the Lord, and you'll be a mighty blessing. You'll say your pilgrims, you're welcome home. Oh, blessed Savior, thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the Angels way to join us in that praise forevermore. Where the angels way to join us in that praise Children's terrors. It goes all me darling. 
I am so glad y'all brought y'all youngins today because I know the Sunday before school and you got half your ten people out there at the Walmart trying to buy school supplies and stuff like that. Best place for them. Best place for them. Everybody's looking at what's going on in TV and stuff and they're trying to figure out what the problem is. I'm going to give you in simplistic terms. I know this is simplistic, but you can look it up yourself. Maybe do a little study on it. The main problem with what's going on with our country with these massacres and stuff is not so much firearms. It is the loss of Jesus Christ in the schools and in the homes, not just the schools. Because I'm going to tell you, everybody talks about taking the prayer out of the school system. Well, they've not only taken it out of the school system, they took it out of their houses. And when you don't have a godly surrounding in your homes, you might be good people. But unless Jesus is ruling in your homes, you've got difficulties. It's hard enough in this world just going along <laughs> fighting the fights. But if you don't understand the spiritual combat that's taking place for the souls of your children's children's children. The very souls. Then you have more problems than you realize. You can be the one who can cook the best chicken and dumplings in this here church. You might make the best biscuits. You might earn the best income, but without Jesus, there's no hope. The reason people kill the way they're killing is because they don't understand the value of life. When you don't value life, I was saying the other day at Wednesday night, this is all free, by the way, so you can't start your clock on me preaching yet. Uh, if you'll open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, though, I'll give you a head start on some of this. Verse 17, we'll read through there. So, the abortion clinic in Baton Rouge had a young lady had an abortion the other day. Well, had a female who had an abortion. I don't know what her age was. And when she had the abortion, the clinic, that's called Delta Clinic, Delta Clinic, did not have the crash cart properly set up. So if you don't know what a crash cart is, if you ever had to visit somebody, if you've never been sick, crash cart has all the, the, the different items needed if someone's heart stops or they have a bleed or something else. And they're usually locked along that hallway somewhere on these different floors to be able to minister to the different needs if someone has an emergency. So the abortion clinic did not have the proper setup in case somebody had an emergency. So this individual, she had an abortion. Now I know everybody has different thoughts on this. Well, you gotta pray for people's souls, man. Don't just chunk rocks. You gotta pray for souls. And when she had that, she went to bleeding. Well, the person who had performed it, I guess you'd call him a doctor, I don't know what it was. They had left, obviously, because there was a nurse that was there with this, this woman. And they couldn't stop all the bleeding. So they had to take her to the hospital after this abortion. And they did a, a total hysterectomy on her. Now, that may not mean something to some of you. But not only will she remember for the rest of her life the day that she did an abortion on her child. She'll never have a child now. We live in a world, we, need, we live in a world that needs Jesus and you're sitting here today and you, you might be up here visiting and stuff and unfortunately this preacher's having a reaction with medication but I'm going to be all right. But are you going to be all right? Because without Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you're going to stand before him very soon. And your priorities, you might have your priorities in all sorts of places today. This, don't start yet. Don't start yet, Ellis. Put your watch away. Okay. I'm, play, I'm just playing with him. We're like brothers. 
It doesn't matter what's going on in your life, what your priority is. Without Jesus, you're heading to a very bad place. And you've got to look past yourself. We're so selfish today. We're so selfish today. Why is alcohol so rampant? Because it's all about me, right? Why is drugs so rampant? Because it's all about me. Why do we have so many struggles with our finances? Because it's all about me. If you ever understand the sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it will transform your life. It'll change you in ways where you'll be a giver instead of a taker. All right, I'm shutting up. I'm going to start now. If you could stand with me, if you're physically able, as we read God's holy word today. Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. It says, Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he had suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Let's use that as our opening verses. Father, I thank you so much today, Lord, for everybody who's here. I thank you for those who are taking care of our nursery. Bless them, Lord. Those who are doing our children's church, I pray blessings, Father. Those on the sound system, I ask you to bless them, Lord, for each one is giving for your glory. May they, Lord, be utilized to make a difference in someone's life. And I pray you take the words of our mouth, Father, to speak to the hearts of mankind. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this word right here, when you start talking about priests, people have a lot of different kind of ideas about priests. And some of you might even be upset at the concept of priests. You get good ideas and you get bad concepts of priests anymore. Uh, as I've pastored, I've had different people react in different ways. But one of the main things that you see when you start talking about this is people really could care less about priests. They really don't even consider this much because we don't really read Leviticus. There's only going to be so many of you who've ever actually studied the book of Le Leviticus. And the people take it and they get confused. I've had people get so confused about the different rituals and different kind of things that are listed in there. But one of the great themes in the book of Hebrew is the high calling, that priestly high calling, that ministry of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, what it does is it tells us to think about this subject. It tells us to consider it carefully, to examine it. So today, that's all I want to do is I want to just take us and I want to look at this particular scripture right here. So what is this, this great high priest to me? What does he matter to you? What happens in your life that makes a difference? When you look over there in uh, verse 17, verse 17, it says that he might be merciful to us. So that Greek word right here is elios. So Elios, what it does is it conveys the idea of looking at somebody and seeing them where they're at. Do you understand that? To see them in their needs, to be able to see them with compassion, to be able to see them and have sympathy for their situation. So what this scripture does, it comes in here and it gives us three examples just out of the New Testament right here. It starts talking to us in Luke chapter 1, verse 58. This is what it says. It says, her neighbors and her relatives heard the Lord had displayed his great mercy towards her, and they were rejoicing with her. And then it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 78, I believe it is, uh, 58, 58, that's 58. You got it right there. I'm, I'm, my brain ain't working. You'll have to forgive me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
So there's something that I'd learned several years ago, and I've actually discussed it before, and it's called dumpster diving. And the reason it kind of catches my attention is because it reminds me of some things my daughter does that always shock me. Because my daughter, I'll be driving along, and she'll see something out there on the side of the road, and she will pick it up. Now, Alan, I'm, I meant to call you on this because Alan does a great job of this. They pick this item up out of the garbage, and what they do is they take it and they rescue it. Hollywood's real big on it. They, they love people who go along and they take different items that were being thrown away or trash and to reinvent it to be used for another purpose so it's not cast away. Alan has something out there on the side of his house. It's a couple old uh, iron bed. It's some old iron bed posts and stuff. And he cut it down and he recreated it for his mother so that she'll have a front porch thing. It's really nice. It's beautiful. It's something that had deteriorated that didn't have its purpose anymore. And he reinvented it for something to be used in an everyday purpose. Sometimes me and you feel like what's been cast away. Sometimes me and you feel like somebody who's been cast into the trash can, like an old Coca-Cola bottle or something like that, and we feel worthless. I had a woman tell me one time she had felt just like someone had taken her and squeezed all of her life out and that all her life was totally useless anymore. We feel used up. We feel abused. We feel dirty and we feel broken because of the sin that's in our lives, the sin that comes and consumes us. But you know what's funny? When you look at this, God sees you in a different way. God sees as somebody who has purpose. Hollywood took and, and so many people want their children to grow up to be stars. They'll give anything. How many of you know uh, people that are professional dancers anymore? I hate to tell you this, but I've actually known several professional dancers. I was actually baptized with one brother Ellis. She worked at a strip club. She was a professional dancer. She got saved and transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Britney Spears, she came along, and you know what? Hollywood loved her in all the world, and some of y'all listen to that music all the time. But have you ever noticed what the world and what Hollywood started doing to her? At 25 years old, she became a multi-multi-millionaire. They, they took and they sexualized her above and beyond. And all the world bought her tapes, including people that call themselves Christians, and they, they took the videos. And what ended up happening to her? She was thrown away. They started making fun of her. Matter of fact, she started having all these mental issues. She started having all these problems, shaved her head, and everybody put it on the front page. See, some of us are like that. The world has taken and abused you. You feel so broken. But what you have to understand is that we serve a merciful high priest who sees you where you're at. And he comes to you in the midst of your desperation and in your brokenness. And he rescues you. He reclaims you. He restores you. Because you have to understand that you are loved. The people in today's society, they don't feel loved. You reckon these people who killed all these multitudes of other individuals, and one of them said that he wanted to be a good soldier, like what they have on those video games. Well, they call it, uh, what's them things called? Uh, call of Duty. Call of Duty. So you have people who murdered 20-some people and then wounded more, and he wanted to be a good soldier. You know why? He doesn't understand. He's lost. People are out there, and what they need to understand is they need a Savior. They need someone to rescue them from their brokenness, from their hurting part of life, where they can feel useful. People feel like they've been chunked out, and Christ comes into your life, and he rescues you from a life that seems so useless. So one of the adjectives you also see in the scriptures right here is we see where God is faithful. So he's a merciful father, and he's faithful as our high priest. So that word faithful, it means that he conveys that he keeps every single promise. Have you ever thought about that in your life? Has anybody ever made a promise to you? Has anybody ever come up to you and he says, I promise forever and ever. Pinky promise is some of the things our little children says. Do you promise? Oh, I promise. But I'm going to tell you something. What the scriptures tells us and it talks about is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. 
that he's going to keep every single promise that he's ever made and every obligation he's made to you. <coughs> In Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, this is what it says. It says, not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Not one. It says in, first, see, Joshua chapter uh, 23, verse 14. Now behold, today I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and all your soul that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. Not one. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. And in 1 Kings, it talks about what something Solomon said. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. I drop all this stuff on Jerry. It says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promises, which he promised through Moses, his servant. You know, they had this man who had wrote these hymns years ago. And as he was, one of the things that records in his life is his deathbed. The words that he spoke out of his mouth. And as you read his story, uh, it's Francis uh, Hovergal. And I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right. But they recorded what this man had said. And he says, it's so splendid to be so near the gates of heaven. I want you to think about this. You're lying on your deathbed. Now watch what he says. It's so splendid to be so near the gates of heaven. He says, I am lost in amazement. There has not failed one word of all his good promises. He's faithful. So as you're looking at your life, what you need to examine yourself with is understanding your relationship with Jesus Christ and knowing that he's always been faithful to keep every word he's ever told you. No matter the situation, you may be broken, you may feel abused, you may feel like your life has been thrown away, and Christ will not desert you. If you will surrender your life to Christ, he'll transform you. You say, well, I've been going to church for years, Brother Blaine. I have been doing these different things of positions in the church. But have you surrendered your life to the master who's kept all his good promises? Has he failed you or have you dropped it? Have you given up on yourself? Have you decided that the way of the world is the way to go because everybody else is doing it? Have you decided that it doesn't matter what you say or what you do because you've had failures in your life? When the master of all creation looks upon you, he sees something different than what you see in the mirror. He sees the promise. Son, daughter, he calls you a child of his. And he says, I will rescue you. I'll transform you. How can it be? Everybody knows my reputation. Did they not know that woman that was caught in the act of adultery? Did they not know the thief that hung upon the cross? Did they not know each and every individual who had problems, who had all these situations where they were so desperate? But what happened when they laid their life before the master. Not just give him lip service. But gave him his, their entire lives. The guy's running through the cemetery and he's cutting himself and he's screaming and he's naked. Everybody knew his reputation. But when he was touched by the master. All the children knew what he was. But God transformed him to who he was to be. So what's this high priest do for me and you? What's he do that really matters? Just like there's two adjectives in that first part of this passage right there, there's two activities that take pay, place in there also. Jesus Christ had to be the merciful and he had to be the faithful high priest to make the propitiation, I never can pronounce that right, for our sins, to be the price. So the propitiation is the sacrifice for my sins. It's the only thing that, that turns away. It's the only substance to turn away the wrath of God. See, there's only one thing. That's the blood of Jesus. 
the blood of the Lamb of God that pays the price for the penalties of our sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me as white as snow. You might be out there, and I don't know if you've seen much snow, but snow, <laughs> all it takes is just a little bit of dirt, and you can see it from a long way off. All it takes is a little stain, and you know that that stuff has been through something bad. Jesus comes in, and he purifies you. He makes you white as snow again. No other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So in the life that people are turning to, and they're trying to find so many occupations, young people turn to the, the video games and stuff, and they get out there, and they, they do these different things, and there's no, no understanding of the value of life, the value of your relationships, the value of your children, the value of your mom and dad, the value of your, of your job. The value of your homes. The value of the place you live. We turn our backs so easily and we see the needs so far away when there's needs who sur that surround us every single day. Verse 18, it talks about the, the, the activity of the high priest. He says, for in that he himself, he suffered being tempted. See, Christ is able to help us because he knows what it's like. So you feel lonely, you feel hurt, you feel broken, you've been abused, you've been used up, and you feel like trash. Won't you think about Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought about who surrounded him? Can you imagine all the temptation he faced, all the trials, all the situations? So the great high priest comes along your side as the pastor who loves you and cares for you. The priest who comes in and makes the sacrifice. You know, it wasn't but just a, a few weeks ago when we were studying about going to the Holy of Holies and how the high priest would come in for this family and they would offer up what they could afford for their, their, the price of the family's sin. And the high priest would go in there and he would sacrifice that animal that was without spot and without blemish, and he would do it on behalf of that family to pay the price for their sins that year. And Jesus Christ, he comes alongside you, and he knows everything about you, and he shed his blood upon Calvary freely to transform you, to save you, to rescue the perishing. Christ comes into our lives, and he knows because he's seen so much, and, and sometimes you feel so broken, and you just need the comfort that only a dear, close friend can give. Sometimes you don't want your children to see it, or your mom, your dad, your, your family. You don't want your family to see you weeping. And Christ comes in there and says, you matter. You see, we make it such a cartoon figure. We make it, the imagery, like it's so fake, like you're reading some other silly book. When this is a historical account, and for those who've truly surrendered their lives to Christ, they know a friend who's always there with them. He knows me, he understands me, and not only does he understand me, he helps me. So you've been out there and you've been struggling in your life, and you're going through these things, and you've heard terrible stuff. You're not alone. Y'all ever heard of Bill Bright? So Bill Bright was the founder of the Campus Crusade. Now, this is years and years ago, young people, and all families of every age group. He started the Campus Crusades, delivering the message of Christ all across the colleges, and Lord knows we need, need that right there. But see, he's still a human being. And he was in a doctor's office, and as he was sitting in there, he was running some tests because he wasn't feeling real well, and he had been out there preaching, and he was feeling a bit run down and stuff. And the doctors were running tests, and they were doing all sorts of exams in him, and he was going to get the results. 
And as he was sitting on that exam table, the doctor comes walking in and starts to share with him. He says, Bill, I, I got something to tell you. And as Bill was sitting there, he goes and starts to tell him what the problem was. He says, Bill, I, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you're going to die. And you don't have long to live. Bill's response to that was, thank you, Lord. Now, I want you to picture this. So you've got to get this in your head because this ain't make-believe. This doctor's coming in. He's telling him, he's telling him somebody who has been serving the master, going around and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, doing what people consider right, and the doctor says, you're going to die. The doctor says, you don't understand, Bill. The disease that you have, you're not only going to die, you're going to die a miserable death. We have to look at the different things to, to try to keep your pain down. He says, well, praise the Lord. I'll see the Lord sooner than I planned. Don't you think about this. What's your response going to be? How are you going to react to that? You see, the high priest that Bill had been serving all those years was still there with him. You might be going through circumstances, and so many times we think that we're in the fight alone, but if you're truly a child of God, you're not alone. And it's just like we've been studying on Wednesday night. That's right, Wednesday night, the Bible study. We have a Wednesday night Bible study. He surrounds you by the blood of Jesus to give you peace in the most trying of circumstances. See, the reason people struggle is because they don't have the peace. They don't understand the word. They don't feel the presence of God. You've got to go into the presence of God. Seek his face. Christ came to him and strengthened him in the most terrible and testing of moments. So you've had terrible testing of moments. How you been doing? How are you handling it? Amid all these trials and temptations of life, do you realize the high priest is with you? With all the problems that you're facing, do you know the high priest will aid you? Or is it just words on a book to you? Is it just scripture? When you start thinking that he suffered, the king of kings suffered. And we were talking just the other day how Peter in 1 Peter, you know, he was crucified upside down. You know why? Because he didn't think he deserved to be crucified the same way the master was. He didn't think he was worthy. So he says, don't crucify me that way. Put me upside down. You feel like your life's been turned upside down. Do you understand he sees you where you're at and that the king of kings can help you? God wants to help each and every single one of us. But are we going to let him? Are you going to let him? And I was reading something by Charles Wesley. And I kind of wrote this out. This is, this is something that Charles Wesley wrote. He says, death of mercy, can there still be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear me, the chief of sinners, to spare, I've long withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face, would not hearken to his call, grieved him by a thousand falls. There for me the Savior stands, shows his wounds and spreads his hands. God is love, I know, I feel. Jesus weeps. And loves me still. Now incline me to repent. Let me now my sins lament. Now my full revolt deplore. Weep, believe, and sin no more. In your life, no matter who you watch as a preacher, because you've got a lot better preachers than me all around, but the Savior is still Savior of all. It's not about the preaching. It's about the Master. You're not here by accident. You're not here by chance. And you might be out there right now and you just feel so broken.
many testimonies could I get from people right here who've been from cancer, who've lost their children, who've lost their parents? How many could stand up and give their testimony of the saving grace of God? People talk about people when they lose somebody and they say, they're holding up good. My question is, is who's holding you up? Because if the master ain't holding you up, it ain't too good. How, how will they ever make it through? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today, as Brother Raymond comes down and all the instrument players, they're going to come and they're going to play an altar call song. And I want you to focus out of anything else. I want you to focus on where you're at with the Savior. Where are you at in your life with Jesus Christ? Brother Jack had told me, he's up here now. Brother Jack had told me, we, I sit and we, we talked to him, and he told me, you know, one time he did all that churchy stuff. He did the churchy stuff. Then he got saved. He told me, and, and he called it, and most people do, they call it a baptism. That had happened earlier in his life. But he got saved, got wet here, got saved here. This can't be your baptism, y'all. You can't be baptized till you get saved. See, your baptism has to follow your salvation experience. Well, you know, I joined the church when I was six years old, seven years old, blah, blah, years old. If your baptism is supposedly in front, all you did was take a swimming lesson. It must follow. Now, they don't save you, but that's your testimony. Now, that don't matter what age you are. Maybe you feel broken today. Maybe you feel like that thing has been thrown out. They throw up and down the highway right here by the house. They go down there to the fast food place. They get them white bags and they chunk them out down the road as they're going. Because they're finished with it. And the stuff they don't want anymore, french fries. Well, that'll go to all them possums out there anyway. And you feel just like one of those trash bags thrown out that window. That styrofoam cup. Somebody else comes along and hits it. It's tore up. The Savior is still with you. He hasn't forgot you. These altars are open. Don't cost nothing in this Baptist church. If you'd like me to pray with you, maybe my wife or Brother Ellis will pray with you. Maybe you just want to spend a moment with Jesus. But today I'm challenging you. I want you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I want you to come. Won't you come? The Won't you come right now? Is right now. To enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you. What you telling him? Time after time, he is waiting before, and now he is waiting again. Still calling to you. you come if you'll take one step toward the I savior just, I, I my friend one. you'll find his arms open wide receive him and all of your darkness will end within your
time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see. to come in. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find His arms open wide. Receive Him and all of your darkness will Within your heart he'll abide. Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see. to come in. I am so glad you're here today, and I'm so glad uh, y'all be forgiving of me if I've struggled today, um, this one of them strange situations. But you know, the great thing is God takes and he speaks to hearts. I hope it is. Am I on, Charlie? I'm on. I'm on. Uh, he speaks to hearts and he leads them to make decisions. And maybe you were scared to come today because I really feel like there's more people that were supposed to come down here. I'm going to tell you. I really do. But um, Miss Debbie Ard, her family's here. Miss Debbie, would you mind coming up here just a moment? Uh, Miss Debbie is a member of a sister church. Uh, her family's uh, buried right out here in, uh, in our cemeteries. And uh, she just feels the Holy Spirit leading her to be uh, work in this, this church. She says, this is my family's church. And she wants to serve here. But she also desires that we pray for her. We pray that the Lord will strengthen her and encourage her and help her in all her life as we lift up each other. Some, I guarantee you, somebody sitting in front of you or back of you today needs, needs your prayers, needs the power of God to minister to them. So today, um, she wants to move a letter. Is there a motion to accept her as our newest member here? <coughs> There's a motion from Brother Robert. Is there a second? All those in favor say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's all we need to do. That's overwhelming. Hallelujah. So today, I'm going to ask you to come down. I want you to shake your hand. And I want you all to be praying for her. Just to do seven days straight. You pray for her. That one minute we pray for our nation every night at 8 o'clock. I'm going to ask you to pray for Miss Debbie. Right? In the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that God, we have a day like this that we can come together to celebrate, Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ, which paid the price upon Calvary for each one of us. I thank you so much, God, that, Lord, as we remember the victory that you've given us, 
that when we see the things going on in the world, that we don't become defeated or overwhelmed by the wickedness of the world, but feel compelled to share the hope to the world. May we as born-again believers never retreat, but Lord, go boldly into the darkness with the light. May we never hide it up under the bushel basket, but Father, may we get up on the highest hill and shout it. And Father, may our lives be examples to others. May we see the things that we do, not so much as from the selfish perspective of what I want or want to do, but on how I can affect somebody with the love of Christ. Lord, bless these servants that have been ministering here for so long. Help our church to be what you've called us to be. Watch over our children as they start school this week, Father. I pray, Father, that you bless them, that you encourage them, that the people that are teaching them will be filled to the Spirit, to the brim, Father, that they will share with those kids the hope of Jesus Christ, that the Word of God will just abound in their lives, that they can make a difference in their schools, whether it be the public, the private, wherever they're at, home schools. I pray, Father, that Jesus Christ will be lifted up. I pray, Father, for a boldness in our schools. Lord, even as they were walking around Franklin County the other day, the, the high school and the different schools, I pray, Father, that, Lord, you place a hedge about those teachers. But, Father, they're always under threat of losing their jobs because of spreading the love of Christ. Bless them, teachers, Lord. Bless them, Father. Encourage them, Father. And, Lord, may all things glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. May you come down here and shake my sister's hand. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. God bless you. I'm so glad you're here.